Severe bone loss. Let's take one case just to understand uh, what need to be done to get a better aesthetic and better trajectory and location of the implants for better uh, positioning of the final prosthesis. So let's take one case, a very severe atrophy of the anterior maxilla. So this lady was referred to me uh, when she had this uh, prosthesis in her mouth. And one can immediately see that the inclination and the position of the implants uh, do not lead to an aesthetic uh, solution. And when she smiles, she has a short lip, she shows too much of her, uh, of her teeth. And this is one very important mark that you have to remember. This is a pathognomonic uh, mark in cases of severe atrophy of the anterior maxilla. And this is the wrinkle above the lip, above the upper lip. This wrinkle you cannot feel with prosthesis since its, its, posi its position is at the area of the floor of the nose, between the area of the nasal uh, labial fold. That, that area where we need, where we have atrophy and we need to feel with bone. So you cannot feel it with prosthesis. So if you look in the pre-op CT, one can see here the amount of bone lost in this anterior area. And we hardly have some available bone left. We have about four to six millimeter of bone, so one cannot uh, place the implant in this bone. And this is the panoramic view of that area. So the implant in the area of the left central incisor was, uh, was mobile and need to be extracted. On the other hand, the implant in the canine left side was not in use, and uh, the first thing was to give her a new transitional prosthesis, a temporary prosthesis, on this three uh, old, uh, previously done implants. So this is the intraoral view, just after extraction of the mobile implant, and one can see here the amount of deficient tissues, not only bone, but also soft tissue. And she is actually in class three relationship, and uh, this is acquired class three, she was not born like this, and this is due to the pattern of resorption of the anterior maxilla. So this prosthesis, transitional prosthesis, was performed for her to support as much as possible, the lips. And when you look at her picture, she looks quite nice and she smiles and she's happy. But if you look closer, this is not enough to get rid of this wrinkle above, above the lip. And still, the upper lip gets shorter when she smiles and uh, folds upwards. And even if she tried to feel her lips like she did, with foreign material, then she gets a very sharp nasal labial fold, which is not a statics. And her tip of the nose might fall down. The first operation that performed for her was combination of subnasal elevation procedure, uh, using the anatomy for the purpose to gain some vertical dimension, and autologous bone graft harvested from the right ramus, as seen here, and this is the first choice for me, harvesting the bone from the ramus, a monocortical bone. I do not perform an inferior cut, and this will support, this is for supporting the upper lip. So, subnasal elevation procedure, I fill the area with a bio or a bovine material, bone, bone substitute, saturated in a platelet-rich plasma or a bone marrow aspirating concentrated, and then the uh, bone blocks that were harvested from the right ramus is uh, fixed to its place with at least two self-tap screw.
And then I add as much as I can, bone substitute. And now look at this. This is not a membrane. This is actually plasma that was treated with human thrombine and play as biological membrane. And then layer suturing. Another important thing is to feel the donor site and to cover it for reuse of the same donor site. And we'll see along the lecture how I reuse the same donor site. Now adjusting, taking off part of the pink part. There is a controversy concerning the use of platelet-rich plasma but there is hardly literature on the combination of platelet-rich plasma with platelet-poor plasma. How do we separate it and how do we use a platelet-poor plasma? So we take the blood as usual for platelet-rich plasma, 20 or 60 uh, milliliter of blood, whole blood, and we use a special vial for centrifugation and we get the three part of the blood, the plasma, the white blood cells and the platelets, and the red blood cells. Now we separate the plasma, what we don't throw it. We use a different vials, separate it from the other part, and then we take the platelets, put it, saturate the bone substitute, the bios, and then we take human thrombine, and we use it on top of the platelets rich plasma and the and the plasma as well. And now it became like a gel, and we saturated a little bit between two gas, and then it's like a biological membrane. And as you seen in the last case, I put it on top of the entire augmented area as a membrane, on top of the uh, of the only bone graft and the bone substitute, and then I close the suture. And this is two weeks later. And what we gain through this, how much bone we could gain through these two procedures, the subnasal elevation procedure and the only bone graft. And this is five months after this operation. If we take a closer look, and we draw a yellow line among, uh, around the previous pre-op a city cut, and we draw a, a blue line around the new bone, where the subnasal elevation procedure was performed and the autologous only bone graft were performed. You can now appreciate the amount of bone gained only by these two procedures. So if you look at this illustration, step one, this is a pre-op on, on one side of the screen, and what you see, the blue shadow, is what we desire to have. So this is the amount of missing bone and tissue that we want to gain. So first stage, first step, is subnasal elevation procedure and autologous bone graft. But yet, if you look, we, we still miss some bone and soft tissue. So we go for the second stage. Now we have two options. One option, is to cover those deficiencies with prosthesis, with the pink part of prosthesis. But the other option is to do it surgically. And we decided for this case to go surgically and to make another layer of autologous bone graft, like a multi-tier technique, a second tier, on top of the first layer. So here is the, first, the second operation done five months after the first one. One implant needed to be extracted due to infection, and we lost some bone there, but we will rebuild this bone now. Screws are taken out. And pay attention where I harvest the bone. We go back to the same donor site that we used five months uh, prior to this operation. So you can uh, appreciate the bone that can be harvested from the same donor site just five months after the first operation. So if you remember, we filled uh, this uh, donor site with uh, bio-saturated with PRP, covered with PPP, 
with so-called biological membrane. And then we use those blocks now as a second tier to gain more horizontal uh, volume to support the upper lip. You remember from the scan that I showed you that we still need quite a lot of horizontal bone there uh, to add more bone to support this lip. So this will do probably this uh, supporting. So I, I cut each time, I cut block and I put it back to decrease the time when the bone is outside. Shape it a little bit and then I fill the area between the gaps with biosaturated with uh, PRP and then I use again the patient on plasma to cover the entire area of the entire augmented area with this plasma uh, treated with human thrombine and act as biological membrane. So as seen before, I cover the entire augmented area with this uh, plasma and then after releasing the periosteum and non-tension closure layer suturing is performed. and then refill again the donor site for maybe a third use of the same area. So I fill it again with bone substitute, biosaturated in PRP, covered this time with a resolvable membrane, bioguide, and then after adjusting the uh, transitional prosthesis, we screwed it in place. I have published the revisited uh, donor site in 2009 about the revisiting of the maxillary donor site, but this is also possible, as you have seen, in the ramus. So this was a situation just to uh, get close look to the donor site five months after the first operation, and this is a blocks that were harvested five months after filling the same donor site to perform a second layer, a second tier on that area. If we look at the histology, histology taking from this block, one can appreciate the amount of vivid bone, a live bone, among the remnant of the bios in that area. So we can still see some of the remnant, but mostly it's a new bone, it's a very good bone, and this of course can, use, can be used as a layer, a good layer, a good block to uh, augment the uh, missing part. Now let's examine the CT scan five months after the second augmentation procedure. We'll examine just two areas that implants are supposed to be there. Areas of the left upper canine and the area of the left upper incisor, central incisor. Let's look first at the upper canine. And if you look, this is 10 months after the pre-op, five months after the subnasal elevation procedure and the first layer of bone graft and five months after the second uh, only bond off just prior to implant placement. Let's draw again the yellow line on the pre-op situation, the blue line on after the first operation, and then a green line after the second tier. And now you can appreciate the amount of bone and support, horizontal support, that uh, we can gain through these procedures. Let's take the area of the central incisor and we'll do the same uh, experiment. We'll draw the yellow line on the pre-op condition, the first blue line after the first operation, and second green line after the second tier. 
And now, if you measure the pre-op uh, vertical and horizontal dimension, we can see five on seven millimeters. And now if we measure, we have 12 millimeters height and 13, uh, sorry, 12 millimeter width and 13 or almost 14 millimeter height. And anyone can place an implant here and in a good trajectory. And we have also supported the lip. So five months later, five months after the second uh, augmentation procedure, now it's time for implant placement and also for connective tissue grafting. Because as you have, uh, as we mentioned, that it's not only bone is missing, but also soft tissue. So it's very important to remember that when we have a severe atrophy, we need to complete both the bone and the soft tissue. So with the aid of the computer, we, we are preparing a surgical template according to the uh, pre-planned uh, position of the implants, as you can see here. And this is operation performing those implants. So screws are taken out and you can appreciate the bone there. And I pr prefer only to do the pilot drilling. I do not like to perform all the drilling through a surgical template. And most of the time I work freehand, just the pilots. And then I add some bone if needed. And now I cut, I harvest from both uh, areas, a, a connective tissue graft from the right and from the left palate. I add some more bone because I use this opportunity to enlarge the amount of support I can give both to the lips and to, uh, to the lips and to the uh, cheeks. Again, I use the PPP, the platelet spore plasma, but this time, because I had so much of uh, a bone substitute, I used also a resolvable membrane, the BioGuide, on top of it, the two pieces of connective tissue graft releasing, again, the periosteum and premium closure, as can see here, by a layer suturing. And then adjusting the, tradition, <coughs> the transitional uh, prosthesis. And this is a panoramic view taken immediately after operation. And let's see if we manage to solve the problem of the wrinkle. So this here, you can see the lady about months after the third operation, after implant placement, and not yet performed the uh, second procedure, the uncovery uh, of the implant. And when she smiles, you can see no wrinkle. The lip is very supported, yet she, had, she has a temporary uh, prosthesis with some pink material to, to uh, overcome the vertical deficiency. But now when she smiles, the nasolabial fold is supported via those two layers of bone graft. And we managed to put normal size or quite long size implant in the right trajectory. So the position of the teeth are in correct place. And she gets a better smile. If you compare it to the smile that she has when she was referred to me, you can immediately appreciate that she had a better looking smile even now before the final prosthesis. Come and visit us in our website www.dsa.co.il
we give master class and I give personal training on different surgical solutions for the atrophied jaw, both maxilla and mandible. Hope to see you.